You know, National Geographic has had the, uh, the privilege of telling humankind's story of exploration and discovery uh, around the planet for 131 years, the planet and beyond. And I think the best way to set this up is to say we want to do that for another 131 years uh, and many hundreds after that. And we know that one of the critical elements of doing that is a healthy planet. And to have a healthy planet, we need uh, forces and energy from all uh, different vectors, including the corporation. Uh, and as we'll get into it today, the corporation at a minimum touches three important constituents, whether that be their customers, uh, whether that be their employees, uh, and whether that be shareholders. And we have three uh, terrific leaders with us today. Uh, on my left is Michelle Patron, uh, who is the Director of Sustainability at Microsoft. She was previously in the Obama administration as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Energy and Climate Director at the National Security Council. She's led efforts such as the U.S. climate deal with China, and she had a moment in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing as the uh, energy attache. Uh, Mike Boots, to her left, is the Senior Director of Advocacy and Government Relations at Gates Ventures, the private office of Bill Gates, where he directs climate and energy efforts. Previously, he led the White House Council on Environmental Quality, was President Obama's environmental advisor in 2014 and 15, and Mike, to many of you, is no stranger to Aspen, uh, having been here as a senior fellow. And to his left is Brandon Nelson, who's general counsel and corporate secretary for JetBlue, where among other responsibilities, he leads the company's environmental, social, and governance efforts. Brandon has been at JetBlue for uh, about a dozen years. He also serves on the investment committee of the company's silicon-based uh, corporate venture capital fund. So let's ease into this a bit. Um, and I'm going to start with Mike in the middle, if I might, for one second. Mike, tell us the difference between working for a gentleman named Obama and a gentleman named Gates. <laughs> um, well, one of them is a politician, and one of them is decidedly not a politician. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I had the pleasure, both of us did have the pleasure of working for Obama. And uh, there's a lot that actually is very similar between the two of them. They're incredibly well studied. They are in, uh, uh, you know, very analytical, uh, demanding of a, a lot of rigor in, in uh, the analysis of what you bring them. But the lens through which they look at that is entirely different, right? So um, Obama is obviously a politician. Bill is a, um, he would describe himself as a technocrat, right? Somebody who uh, thinks a lot about politics, but doesn't look at it from a partisan perspective at all. Um, and so uh, that distinguishes a lot about how that information gets filtered. The other, the other reality is that, um, and there are parts of, uh, of the administration that certainly thought about uh, the private sector and markets, but the world that I lived in and interacted with the president, uh, private capital was not a big driver of that work. Um, and now private capital uh, and my time with Bill is what drives most of this work. Michelle, what would you add just organizationally? White House? versus Microsoft? So I think the, the similarity between the White House and, and Microsoft is, is it's a whole of government or a whole of company approach, right? Operations, devices, real estate, our work with our customers. So it's, it's everything. I think one of the main differences is that for me, the White House was really a top-down approach, setting the, the agenda and then working with the, the different agencies to implement it. And with Microsoft, it's a lot more organic. There's a lot of different parts of this that, that, that are interested and engaged. So there's what we want to do from a corporate level, but also what our employees and the different business units want to do. And the other area where it's different is the levers, right? White House was really focused on policy and regulatory and pulpit. And for, for Microsoft, we think that the most important lever and the most scalable lever is technology. Great, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Brandon, I've always uh, been curious about this with airline executives. So if we check the <laughs> schedules correctly, Oh, no. JetBlue flies to Denver. <laughs> JetBlue flies to Denver, but not to Aspen. So, what happens to you when you get to Denver? Are you allowed to take another airline, or no? You drive. Do you, do you take an Uber? You drive. Uh, definitely not an Uber. We have a great partnership with Lyft. Uh, <laughs> but it is. Uh, you do raise a, a couple of interesting points. So, presumably, none of us walked here to Aspen. So, we all either flew into Denver or flew directly. So, we've all had. Um, you know, a chance to fly, which means that we've had some impact on the environment through our flying. So how do we think about that? And especially 
Uh, what's happening a lot lately, I don't know if you've heard of this concept of sort of shame flying. Yes. Uh, that's happening a lot in Scandinavia. Europe, the, the, in Scandinavia yep. in particular, um, we certainly see that likely coming to the United States. So how do we think about these things and how do we think about our footprint given the context of our business, which we have to acknowledge is inherently uh, impactful to the environment. So we can talk about how we sort of prioritize investments and decisions that we make being mindful of that impact. Okay, all right. So two forces that I think we would all agree are very defining of our world right now would be the forces of mobility and the forces of connectivity. Um, Michelle, you are right in the middle of both of those uh, at, at Microsoft. Brandon, I'm going to come to you in a second at JetBlue, certainly with respect to mobility. But both those forces end up, and you alluded to it, Brandon, consuming more and more and more energy as opposed to less. So start with Microsoft when you think about the value add that Microsoft brings to the world with respect to those two forces, and yet the interesting juxtaposition that requires more and more energy to affect all that. Talk about that from Microsoft's eyes. So this goes to the heart of why we are so engaged on climate change and why um, it really aligns with our business interest. You know, for us, it, it's our operations, right? We are consuming more and more energy to, to power the data centers that make the modern computing work just from a, a sense of show of hands, how many of you think that Microsoft consumes as much um, energy as a town? Raise your hand. How many of you think that Microsoft consumes as much energy as, as a city? You're right. How many of you consume, think Microsoft consumes as much energy as a state? So a small state right now, uh, and you're absolutely correct. A small she told state us right this now. in a briefing <laughs> session, so we knew how to answer. Think, think Vermont, Alaska. Um, and if we continue to grow, we'll consume more uh, electricity than the largest utility in North America. So that creates a huge opportunity and responsibility for us to both deploy uh, low carbon, zero carbon energy. We've set goals to do 100% of that through solar, wind, and hydro. We're about 60% of the way there. Uh, but also to develop new technologies that really get to not just the, the low carbon, the zero carbon piece, but the reliability piece. So when we build a data center, we have for every <coughs> megawatt that we pull from the grid, we also have a megawatt of backup that can come on if, if the grid goes down. Uh, traditionally, those were diesel, then we switched to natural gas. Now we want to be zero carbon, so we're doing a lot of research on storage and on fuel cells to do that because we recognize that there is going to be this growth of concentrated energy consumption, but it needs to be zero carbon. And so that's kind of a, a huge part of, um, of, of what we're doing. One, one last thing I want to say that, that helps incentivize us to accelerate uh, our action is that Microsoft actually has a, a carbon tax one of the, the, the first companies and, and, and the only companies that internal, it's not a, a shadow price, it's not a threshold price about what investments go forward, it's an actually tax that we charge each of our business units for one, our, the operations, the carbon that comes from our operations, two, the carbon that comes from our electricity generation, and three, the carbon that comes from our travel. Um, we travel a lot. And so right now that's $15. We just raised it to $15 a ton. Um, and that helps us fund and accelerate our um, you know, achievement of our goals. It also incentivizes um, better behavior on this. And so it's both the behavior side and the fun side. But we're very conscious of this. And this is kind of the, the, the big um, focus for us, at least within our four walls. So Brandon, let's uh, go to JetBlue. How do you balance this, uh, a world that is increasingly connected, a world yeah. that is increasingly on the move, and yet the uh, energy and particularly the fuel that's required to move those people. How do you think about that? Sure, so I, you know, the, the first thing I think is, I think we have to acknowledge aviation's role in the economy. Um, you talked about the travel at Microsoft. So it, it really is part of the backbone and the engine of our economy, moving goods uh, and also people. So, so how can you do that now in a way um, that has the least amount of impact. So we prioritize it over investments. So if you look at our largest cost and our largest expense is, is fuel. And so what are some things that we can do uh, putting aside you know, future types of fuel or alternative fuels, but you can invest in aircraft and engine, the engines that are more fuel efficient. So we've announced in the last five years, uh, call it up to $10 billion in capital improvements for aircraft and engines that are anywhere from 15 to 30% more fuel efficient. So that's one thing that we, we look at. We also look at it from a public policy perspective. We uh, lobbied the prior administration, um, probably some of your colleagues, not this group, so we're not picking on you, 
Um, but you think about an air traffic control system. And our current air traffic control system is based on this World War II sort of radar technology that's completely inefficient. Um, there are GPS, far, uh, far f uh, much more technological advancements in how you can position aircraft. So what does that mean? So your flight to Denver, from JFK to Denver, I can take a more direct route, a more precise route. Um, that will burn less fuel. You'll be in the air a lot less longer. So we advocate on the public policy side, and we also prioritize our investments. So Mike, jump in here. Uh, one of the uh, characteristics, if I remember this correctly from our conversation that Gates employs, is really thinking about this intersection between policy, technology, and markets. So when you think about how Michelle thinks about it from Microsoft or Brandon from JetBlue and all their prox as proxies for around the country, and you think about where you're gonna invest, tell us where those, how those three line up, how they intersect, and where you feel you're able to make the most impact. Yeah. So Bill you know, comes from a background in technology. It's what allowed him to build Microsoft in the way that he did. He uh, thinks about technology and the work that he and Melinda have done at the Gates Foundation on healthcare and global development. Um, and when it comes to the work we do at Gates Ventures, a good chunk of that is related to climate and clean energy. Uh, and it's what led him to create uh, this venture fund called the Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, which is a fund with a number of other high net worth individuals, uh, a little more than a billion dollars to invest in kind of big bets um, with potential high payoff uh, uh, and high, you know, high benefit on the back end. Um, but it was really meant to tackle the full suite of uh, sectors of the economy, as both of these guys talked about, that are impacted uh, by climate change and that are being disrupted by climate change. And so um, the way we've looked at it is we take, uh, we take a look at the hard to decarbonize parts of the economy, whether that's changing the way we um, build things and make things, uh, or the transportation sector or the agricultural sector, uh, and really think about where is other private capital going in those spaces? Um, and so where is the white space where capital from people like Bill who have maybe more flexibility or more patience for return on that money, that, that those, those investments can be um, sort of additive to whatever else is already happening out there. That's what drives the technology side of where Breakthrough Energy puts its money. Um, but the truth is, you can, you can create a whole bunch of startup companies, have a bunch of great technologies out there, um, and they can kind of fall flat if you don't think about building the markets around them to ensure that uh, there's uptake across the economy and that there's a commercial viability beyond just that one company for a market in storage or a market in geothermal or a market in any of these other uh, great sectors. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about how you build the markets uh, that go around those individual technology investments. And then uh, as both uh, Michelle and Brandon talked about, you know, you really need in a heavily regulated sector like energy or transportation or agriculture, you need smart policy that, uh, that reinforces both the ability for that technology to have its impact and for those markets to grow. And so um, Breakthrough Energy is often talked about as a technology fund, and it is, but we, we view it as sort of uh, those three legs of the stool as being essential to it having any impact in the real world. So Michelle, I want to come back to the um, notion you raised up front that uh, Microsoft has a power demand equal to that of a state. If I read this correctly, blockchain technology, some would uh, some would estimate that blockchain technology alone will have an energy demand equivalent to a sovereign country. Um, that type of technology is coming at us quickly. It's coming at us quickly, particularly in a cybersecurity world. How does Microsoft think not just about your footprint? but all the places that technology is moving and what that footprint is looking like with respect to energy consumption. So I think that there, the blockchain is the ledger piece. There's also cryptocurrency, so I think that's the, yep. the, the, the main concern, less about blockchain and more about the, the cryptocurrencies. But I think we can't just look after ourselves. This needs to be something that the entire sector, and frankly, everybody, you know, who, who, who is engaged in the electricity sector. And, you know, while Microsoft can come in and because we do have the capital or we do have um, a large procurement team, 
we can negotiate the deals, but we are increasingly focused on the policies that enable others to be able to purchase renewable energy or be able to deploy these kind of technologies as, as well, and, and also create the expectation that that's kind of what, what should be done. So stick with that for a minute. Um, policies are at the federal level, at the state level, yep. to the local level. Where are you finding the biggest opportunity for Microsoft to enact change in those policies? I think it's really been for us, especially on the renewable side, at the state and the, mm -hmm. and, and the local level, because that's where you have a really common interest here. You, people are interested in having more clean energy. They are interested in the job impact. They're interested in a lot of times in the, in the increase in tax bases. A lot of the development for these solar or wind projects happen to have in rural areas too. So there's, there's a lot of alignment. And it's in states across the country. That's what's been so interesting. We have 10 projects, which are about two gigawatts, uh, uh, of electricity, and it's you know from Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Texas, Illinois, um, Wyoming, and Kansas. Let me give you the Wyoming example because everyone is so surprised that we're able to do a, a project and, and we're able to work with the local utility and the local regulators there to get it done. We wanted to to, to power our, our data center with wind, 240 megawatts. Um, the the local utility wanted to build a new coal plant to be the um, basically the backup reliability for the, um, for, the, for the wind project, and they also wanted to rate base it. So they wanted to build a new coal plant, and they wanted to charge the local uh, community for that, and that's not anything we wanted to do. We want to pay our own way. We want to be low carbon the whole way. Um, and so we thought, well, you know what? We have these backup generators. Instead of having them just be standby, can we actually make them you know, quick start, very, very, very efficient natural gas that when the, the local city, Cheyenne, needs electricity, that we can actually provide electricity from our backup generators to the, the local community. Um, and that we were able to really get a breakthrough and that the, the utility didn't need to build the plant, they didn't need to rate base, um, they ended up lowering the cost for electricity for the local community. And it was a win-win for everyone and so we were able to get local approval for the project for the tariff. So it's really been just, just getting everyone in a room, feel it, finding out what the shared interests are and thinking outside the box for innovative policy structures. So Brandon, let's, let's talk not just about JetBlue but the aviation yeah. industry. Is there a uh, wh where is the discussion inside the industry around uh, a sustainable aviation fuel? Yeah. Is there a biofuel? Is there a hydrogen fuel? What, wh where is that conversation? So, there, so the biofuel technology exists, um, and you're seeing uh, some of the airlines, United in particular, I think. Uh, like many of us, I flew United on the way out here, and they're very uh, forward with their messaging about their kind of uh, eco flying or whatever they've, they've named one of their aircraft. So the, the biofuel technology is here. What has been slow to develop are the refineries and the, the processing of that fuel. Uh, and that's where you really need those local state partnerships to provide the right policies and incentives for the patient capital to come through and make those investments. But the technology from an engine standpoint, from a fuel standpoint, it absolutely exists. And we, like United, we've also uh, flown certain flights using biofuel, but the, uh, the capacity is just quite not, it's not there yet. Is there a, without wanting to put you into an awkward position, is there a time frame yeah. that you think about on this? Uh, certainly it's something that, that we look at and we've, we've entered into certain agreements with uh, potential producers. Um, we tend to look at this and kind of the two to three year horizon. Again, some of that is subject to what happens in the commodity markets, what happens on the public policy standpoint. You're seeing California provide some really interesting incentives, so you're seeing some development there. But it really is sort of a capacity production refinery game. And I think across the industry, that's how we're looking at it, not just from a- And, and do you find it a very collaborative process across the industry in terms of these discussions, your counterparts and like. Where you see a lot of the collaboration or the alignment is through the OEMs. Yeah. So you think of Airbus, you think of Boeing, uh, your friends in Seattle, you think some of the engine makers. Um, and so that's where you really see the, the collaboration more so than through the airlines itself, but through the owners of the technology. Okay. Mike, you talked about the, um, again, this three-legged stool here between uh, policy, technology, and capital or markets, one of the things that I know you've, you've really explored at Gates Ventures are the, the public and private partnerships with respect to capital, and particularly 
with the European Commission. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Bill started Breakthrough Energy f about four years ago uh, to try to align what I was saying earlier, private, both, both really patient and super flexible private capital, meaning you could, um, you know, you could invest at any stage of the innovation cycle. You could invest in, in kind of early stage companies or late stage companies. You had flexibility. Um, at where they were in the, in the market. Um, and it's a 20-year fund uh, as opposed to a five or a seven or a 10-year fund. Um, all these folks that are investors in that fund expect to make returns, uh, so it's not a philanthropic fund. Um, but they recognize that it might take a few decades to get there, and they're all able and willing to absorb that risk. Um, that said, it's only a billion dollars. I mean, a billion dollars is great, but uh, we need several uh, funds like that in order to tackle the challenge uh, that's out there. And so we do a fair bit of work trying to encourage other investors or potential investors who have similar flexibility and similar patience to put money in these hard to decarbonize uh, technology sectors uh, in the hope of, of growing that pie. And yet, there's a whole set of things that are going to make those technologies and those markets work that private capital alone can't tackle. Um, and so we look often for, uh, for partners on the public sector side who can do, frankly, much of the early work, right? Some of the early stage R&D, the cultivation of these innovations within labs and universities, um, the transition of that uh, into early market adoption um, and some demonstration. Uh, that is generally the strength of most governments. Building companies, usually not the strength of, com of governments. Um, but the, the European Commission is a good example. We established uh, a handful of partnerships with individual governments as part of Breakthrough Energy. The Commission is one of them. They acknowledge that you know, the reputation of, of private industry working with the Euro European Commission hasn't been the greatest, right? It's a massive bureaucracy. Uh, lots of red tape and lots of, uh, it's tricky to, to navigate. Um, and what they said on the clean energy side was, we are really good at investing in this super early stage R&D side. We have great labs and universities. We know how to feed that system. And we are terrible at turning that into companies that are homegrown in Europe that can have some success in building those markets that I was talking about earlier. And so, um, we have been able, with the brand that is Bill and Breakthrough Energy, to explore some opportunities to do things a little bit differently. And so the European Commission came to us and said, look, we are going to take some of that um, publicly appropriated money that's currently sitting in kind of R&D accounts, and we're going to um, sign an MOU with you guys, and we're going to turn over that money to Breakthrough Energy Ventures, to the private fund, to try to invest in new startups across Europe that could then you know, seed some of those, uh, those businesses there. Uh, it's a pilot. We're going to see if that works. I think in many jurisdictions, the governments would not be willing to turn that money over to a private fund. Uh, but we're optimistic that we can show a slightly different model and a return for them on bringing companies uh, based there. So we talked about public-private partnerships. Let's talk about private private, and in particular uh, with Michelle here from Microsoft and Brandon for, for JetBlue. Michelle, take a second and describe for the audience what is AI for Earth, and then I want Brandon to discuss how AI for Earth has been and is being applied at JetBlue to basically anticipate climate change risk and how that impacts your business. Absolutely. So one of the biggest challenges we see right now is that they're on the environmental startup um, is really it's, it's really hard for, for, for these, these um, ideas to, to get out there. Um, companies that are doing climate action are looking internally. At the same time, government is really taking its foot off the gas when it comes to investing in these types of, of things. And so, at, and this happens to be the time that we need the most disruption in this space. So that's where AI for Earth comes in. We, um, it's, a, it's a $15 million five-year program. The money is great, but five years, as you know, is, is like, you know, centuries in, for a tech company. So for Microsoft to commit this for five mm -hmm. years shows our, our real mm -hmm. commitment. And what it is, is is putting advanced computing, you know, AI, machine learning, cognitive services in the hands of organizations that are on the front lines of issues related to water, 
agriculture, climate change, and biodiversity so they can put these tools to work. It's both providing technology and, and capital to, to, to some of these organizations. It's also um, giving them the, the, the ability to upskill their capacity to deal with them. We do that through trainings in Redmond. We also have office hours every week with our data scientists and our engineers to help them uh, be able to, um, to, to take this to the next level. And, and then also where we see real, real promise, we will put additional capital in to really take the, the projects to scale. Uh, we've been doing this for about two years now. The reception and, and, and interest has, has been overwhelming. Uh, we have about 380 grantees in 36 states in 50 co countries that are looking at huge challenges related to glacier melt, like we're doing with Nat Geographic and some of the explorers, to um, uh, forest cover, to um, uh, you know, species, uh, key species. So it's been it's been truly amazing to see how people are putting uh, technology to work. So Brandon, pick it up and talk about how AI <coughs> for it's sure. working at JetBlue. Yeah. So um, so very cool. So if you if you think about our business, we our primary assets are aircraft, and we can move those around. We have certain network structures and strategies, uh, but we have the ability to move those around. And par a large part of our business is tourism in the Caribbean. And if you think about climate change and the impact on coral reef, beach erosion, uh, that's naturally gonna have an impact on the demand of our customers. So if you see Turks and Caicos, it's not as beautiful as a place as it once was, how do we adjust our network and our strategy accordingly? So using this technology and partnering uh, with, another, with another third party business partner, we looked at sort of trends and um, you know, tourism trends, but also trends of, of beach erosion, what's happening to the coral reef, and how is that impacting demand to certain places, and not just sort of adjusting our network uh, in a reactive way, but bringing that in as a forecasting tool to plan for the business, what does it look like in three years or in five years. So it's a really cool use of technology, and it's sort of where all of these all of these concepts converge. If I could just do one Please. really also interesting, uh, another another um, grantee is called Sylvia Terra, and what they've done is they've taken land cover analysis that has been developed by uh, with another AI for Earth partner with IoT sensors, and put together a census of every tree in the United States. Wow. And with that information, you can then That's understand amazing. what the carbon sequestration potential is um, and take it to the next level for, for landowners, for private landowners, for them to have um, optionality on do they go and harvest their timber this year yeah. or do they actually wait and sequester. And if they do sequester, you can create a marketplace for people to pay them to sequester um, and, and get a whole credit system going. So it's just tremendous what, what the potential of both the technology, but this, these ideas are to really unlock innovation in the space we need so bad. Do you know how many trees there are in the United States? <laughs> Trillions. Trillions, okay. <laughs> okay. Mike, back to you. Uh, many of the technologies and white spaces that you're investing in are 30, 40, 50 year payout in terms of returns. And yet you work uh, inside the Gates ecosystem where I think we're right that Bill and Melinda Gates have this wonderful expression that they are impatient optimists. So how do you balance impatient optimism with 40 year investment strategies? So you're right, that is, that is a line that they use often to describe themselves. They feel, I mean, at, at the very heart, they are incredibly optimistic about all the challenges they work on. They would not be focused on, uh, on tackling them if they didn't see uh, a clear path in their mind to getting there. Um, so the optimism drives much of our work, both at Gates Ventures and at the foundation. Um, the impatience comes from their recognition that these challenges they're working on uh, are super time sensitive, um, that in, in many cases, uh, action soon, right, will help to diminish the curve you have to kind of climb later. Um, that said, almost in every instance, the capital you need to tackle that stuff cannot be capital that sees or demands a return so quickly. Um, and so Bill, uh, I, I mean, it might sound conflicting, but it, it really isn't. He has an impatience and an urgency that permeates the work we do and a recognition that most people, most governments, most private investors have a demand for 
relatively uh, near-term return. And tackling some of these hugely systemic problems, right, shifting the economy in all of these sectors will take time. But that if you don't start now, we will dig a hole that's harder and harder to get out of. And so um, that's where the urgency comes from, even with a long time horizon. So I'm going to come to the audience here in a few minutes, but let's talk about um, research and development. R&D is a place where quiet capital goes to work, um, and it doesn't get a lot of attention. And then all of a sudden, one day, there's a, a breakthrough. For all three of you, where, where are you seeing research and development, whether it be inside Microsoft, whether it be inside JetBlue or across the industry with biofuels or Mike and your investments, where are you seeing some hope with regard to R&D as it relates to new energy solutions that create a sustainable economy for us? I think there's two places inside Microsoft that really um, get me excited. The, the first is on, on the new energy technologies, in particular mm -hmm. storage and the ability to try and um, you know, crack that long duration seasonal storage. I think there's, there's a lot more work that has to be done, but I think there's a lot of progress that has been made. Um, the other is, is quantum and, and what quantum can, can really unlock in, in the energy space and in, in the climate space writ large and, and still a, a lot of work that needs to be done to bring that to, to reality. But um, there's really a lot of promise if it's in optimization of materials and, 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 other, and, and even carbon capture. Mm -hmm. Brandon, how would you answer that? Yeah, so you mentioned in the intro our corp. So we have a CVC, we have a corporate venture capital mm -hmm. uh, dedicated fund. It's off the balance sheet. It's located in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we're most excited about, and the way we approach it, not quite the 20 or 40 year horizon, but we have, with the way we construct our portfolio, sort of zero to 18 months, think, you know, 20, 30 percent, two to five years, you know, 40 percent or so then the balance kind of longer term. And where we're really seeing that longer term is in uh, electric propulsion. And so you'll see if you go, I think most of these investments are, uh, we've publicly announced, but there have been a couple in our portfolio when you think about uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles um, being electrically uh, powered or, or electric powered. So uh, we look at that space. We also look at shorter kind of regional travel so I don't know if it's going to be on a transcon flight, but think a Seattle to Portland, um, kind of 700 miles or under. We're seeing a lot of promise in the electric propulsion space. Okay, so we have storage, quantum, electric propulsion. Mike, what would you add? Um, I was going to say something about the technology piece and then talk a little bit about some venues that I think are where some interesting R&D stuff is happening. On the technology side, I would say the what's happening in the industrial space is super interesting. So low, low greenhouse gas, uh, steel, and cement, and the kinds of things that we have to do to like uh, transform the way we we build. I can't remember the exact stat, but like the number of New York cities that this world is building every year is. Uh, is significant. Every 30 days. Every 30 days. Thank 35 you. years. Um, it's insane. And so making sure that there's uh, entrepreneurs and researchers doing really good R&D on that side of things, it's, it gets less attention than it should in the private capital space and in the government space. Uh, what I was going to say is there's some really interesting uh, work happening in a set of incubators and accelerators around the country and frankly around the world that survive on fumes really they get very little government support they get some private capital support but they are the super important part of this chain where you take uh, young entrepreneurs and researchers who are used to working in labs and universities put them in place where they can interact with the players in the market and uh, and those with private capital and kind of uh, mentor them through starting companies and, and, and building them and, and really being able to hand off what is that small startup uh, exercise to big companies like the two of these, right? That is not a very natural uh, transition and there, there aren't a lot of systems in place to do that, but there are a, a growing network of accelerators and incubators that are taking on that challenge and it's a super important thing that we've got to solve. Great, let me pause and just uh, see if there are questions or comments from the audience. Right up front here. Just wait for a microphone, sir. Oh, sorry, you, sorry, go ahead and then we'll go to this gentleman here. All right, uh, so I, I know you mentioned uh, Microsoft has a, has a price for carbon, but I think in general in both these companies, do you have a sense of 
the premium that you would pay or the profit you would forego to achieve certain goals? Uh, and like, what, what does that $15 price on carbon cost Microsoft as a corporation? Uh, well, you know, it co comes against our own emissions, right? And so that's, in, and the way that we traditionally have set it, it's an internal clearing price. So it's the cost of, one, what we need each year to achieve our energy and our carbon reduction goals. So, you know, we've said, we, aside from the 100%, we have, actually, we have um, interim milestones, um, in which you know, the next one is 70% by 2023. And so what it costs for us to, to achieve that, what it costs, we also are carbon neutral. So for the all emissions that we can't reduce, we go and we invest in carbon reduction projects. So it's the cost of those projects. And then we also set aside funds for innovation. Um, that we want to invest in internally um, and support others to, to do more in this space. So once we get those funds all together, uh, we then figure out what the price is. And that's kind of how we have come up with the price. Uh, recently, you know, we're looking at different ways to not just use it as a funding vehicle, but actual a, a behavioral change. Is it 1% of your profits or 100%? Yeah, I, I, I don't know offhand. Too soon to know. I frequently show the video a few years ago about Microsoft uh, using the internal price on carbon, uh, directly taxing or assessing a fee to the different business units. And there was a stat some years ago about, and I frequently say it, I'm sure it's stale. I wonder if you can maybe update it. It's not even my question, but it builds on what you just said, that Microsoft saved $10 million a year for the third year in a row. And so successful this was that they created a playbook for other companies to replicate the best practices. Do you, can you say how much you've saved? And then I have a question about advocacy, really, and what you're doing nationally with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. You recently were, that group was on Capitol Hill recently, and I'd love you to comment on the need for really federal advocacy and bringing other companies to do this because a few exceptional companies like Microsoft is not how we fix this. We need so much more, right? And that's where your leadership could really come in. So I'd love to know how much it's saving, if you know that yep. number, and say something about federal advocacy and bringing others to push for a federal price with a global reach. Please, thank you. Thank you. So um, in, in terms of the metrics that we look at, uh, we've reduced our, our, our footprint by 15 million metric tons since the, the price has been um, implemented in 2012. We have also brought something on the lines of 28.7, God, I think it might be billion kilowatt hours of electricity. Um, and the projects that mm -hmm. we've invested in have, um, we, we look for projects where we can also um, help the local communities where, around where we operate, um, if it's reforestation or, or agricultural and methane capture. And so it's, it's benefited 7.5 million people. So that's kind of the, the top line. Um, one thing is, is the funds that we have used to invest in technologies, one was for our campus. So we did a project where we put IoT sensors in all of our buildings. We have over 100 buildings on campus. Uh, we then uh, collected the information and used um, artificial intelligence to get insights of, of how we can better use electricity, how we can better use heating, space utilization. That reduced our energy consumption by 15% and saved us $10 million a year. Um, it also created a new product which we've been able to, to take to market. Um, and different you know, companies around the world now are using it with different partners. In terms of, of, of policy advocacy, we have gotten to, to the point where, where we realize that there's only so much a single company can do. And we really do think federal policy is critical. We understand that the politics right now may not support the kind of um, policies we think are, um, are, are needed, but we need to start our advocacy. So two months ago, we came out calling for uh, the federal government to, to support carbon taxes and carbon pricing. Uh, we joined 75 companies last month on Capitol Hill. This was the first time in 10 years that corporations had gone to DC to go to Congress to say to take action and that that action has to include some type of carbon pricing. We've also joined the Climate Leadership Council, which is advocating for a price that starts around $40 and goes up um, to, to hit very ambitious emissions targets, uh, which are you know, which would exceed the, the Paris goals that the United States set. Uh, we think it's important to be at the table by with a, a broad cross section of companies, which are part of CLC. So it includes energy companies, it includes uh, car companies, it includes consumer facing companies uh, and financial companies. Because at the end of the day, we've been in, in this business for a while. We know that policy will only get done if everyone is at the table. And so we think that the, the conversation has to start and we're gonna be leaning in more. 
Other questions from the gentleman right here on the right, my right. Thanks for this discussion. My, one question is you, Michael, you mentioned about the idea of the need for the context of a smart policy for this to work and move forward. Uh, would each of the panelists choose one thing in terms of smart policy which you'd like to see enacted, which feels that we really would move ourselves forward? E easy for me, it's air traffic control uh, reform. And what we had proposed would be sort of the FAA has kind of a dual mandate, it's the regulator. Um, they're also, they also run the system. And so why don't we decouple that and, and you know, maybe this will gain some traction given sort of the recent challenges Boeing has had. So focus on regulating the airline. Let's take the operation of it, put it in a not-for-profit or other type of quasi-governmental agency where we've seen that happen in Canada and other places. And, and that allows you to really invest for the long term. So you're not subject to these annual appropriations or even a five-year FAA bill. So for us, it would be to decouple that function, uh, set up a separate air traffic control system to allow you to invest in new technology, and it's essentially a smart grid for the air that would increase the efficiency um, at, a, at a level of a magnitude that would have the largest impact of anything that we could do. If I could just follow, and, and where is that in terms of Adoption of that. That sounds yeah. today. <laughs> Has it been born? It, um, <laughs> it, it was. No, there was a bill. So uh, Schuster, who is uh, no longer yes. in Congress, uh, he was a champion of it. Um, right. We got it through sort of committee. We got it to the floor. But it, it died for reasons that we, we won't bore you with here, which is, which is really a shame. You probably won't bore us with it, but we won't go there. <laughs> Mike. Um, I would say uh, kind of rethinking the tax incentive structure around some of the technologies that we've been talking about today. So I think t we think technologies have done a, I mean, tax incentives have done a great job of um, making renewables what it is today. And without that structure in place for as long as it's been in place, um, it would have been um, super hard for that to yield the market that is there today. When we think about sort of the next 10 or 20 years, we think about a structure that's more kind of tech neutral, but that encourages the disruption that Michelle was talking about earlier, and to um, build into that you know, some incentives that really get uh, those who are looking in these hard to decarbonize sectors, places where there haven't really been tax incentives, uh, to encourage uh, private capital to flow that way. So there's both a near term and, and then the long game. The long game, obviously, we think that a, that a price on carbon is, is critical, especially to get to these harder to reach industries that we've talked about, if it's in um, industrial, if it's in buildings and, and some of the other areas. Um, in the near term, there are things that both in the US and, and Europe that, that can help get these technologies off the sidelines that exist today, especially in the energy technology. And it's allowing um, the behind the meter assets to participate in electricity markets. Mm -hmm. So if it's storage, it's, it's tech neutral. And right now, they're not really able to participate in wholesale markets. And so being able to give them that opportunity, and in Europe being able to extend the incentives that are given to the, the assets that are in front of the meter, so the traditional solar and wind, to make sure that those incentive structures also are given to behind the meter in Europe um, if they're doing the same thing in terms of carbon reduction or renewable energy procurement. And we think that can at least in, in the very near term go a long way toward, towards really helping us in a market-friendly way. Mm -hmm. Just while we're waiting for another question, let me. Uh, change the, uh, the tone here for a second. Employees, um, 23,000 at JetBlue, 100 and how many at Microsoft, 100? Uh, close to 130,000. 130,000, and Mike, how many employees indirectly through, through, all, your, <laughs> through all your investments? A lot hundreds, fewer. Hundreds, a lot okay. Fewer. Yeah. All right, let's, st let's stick with Microsoft and JetBlue. That constituent has uh, a really important voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the momentum that you see in Washington and and Brandon, I know earlier that as you travel to Washington, the, uh, the way corporates are able to lead and put climate change on, on the map. How important is the employee base? How much are they pushing you? How much are they responding to the changes that you're making and, that, and themselves being impatient and saying we want more quicker with respect to policies that uh, achieve a more um, uh, carbon neutral energy future? they're demanding it. I think it's a really important point because you talk about the stakeholders 
that you mentioned earlier, you know, we have our owners, our yep. customers, and employees, which we call crew members internally, uh, and we're, we're seeing them demand a lot. So for example, in June, we're offsetting all of our customer flying um, for the month of June, which is great. I mean, it may be a small step, um, but that initiative, along with others like it, or proposed or demanded by our internal uh, crew members. So they are one of the constituents, or probably the constituent, that's pushing the hardest. What I will say on the others, on customers, we really need more sort of public demand for this stuff. So whether it's policy or, or other type of advocacy efforts, uh, there's, there's some level that you're getting, certainly people that are in this room and at this conference, but we really also need the public to demand this, because, but we are getting it from our crew members. So earlier today, Edelman showed their trust index, and they showed something along the lines of between 70 to 80 percent of employees that work for tech companies want their company and want their CEO to reflect their values. And then there was another participant that said, our panelists that said, uh, if anything, that understates how important it is to, to the employees. Um, our employees are, are engaged. They're very passionate about this issue. They reach out to me personally. They reach out to our senior leaders. They have communities where they, they talk about and organize and, and come up with ideas. Um, we operate in a very tight labor market. And so it, it's, it, it, it's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, one of the things that we've done is try to um, help uh, encourage them to come up with ideas that help us um, improve our own campus. So there are things that we've done on campus that are direct results, um, both of, of their ideas as well as the pace of which we've done it. So we have a zero waste cafe uh, on campus, and that is directly as a result of, of, of um, you know, requests and, and mobilization from our employees. We have, I think, the pace of which we have taken out single-use straws uh, on campus is another thing as it's reflected by the, the engagement by our employees. Excellent. I think there was a question over here. Please. I wanted to uh, thank Michael for his <clears throat> advocacy for accelerator groups and technology groups that can make early ideas. I'm COO of an organization called Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and the mission of that organization is to mobilize young leaders around the world to bring ideas and initiatives and technologies back for incubation. And so that development of a relationship between SOA and the corporate partnerships like that are represented on the stage is extremely important to facilitate many solutions for this issue of climate in the oceans. And I think the only way for us to get to that point is that relationship. So how approachable, how do we develop that relationship with the corporates that will be essential for this partnership? You guys are corporates more than me. <laughs> Um, so for, you know, for us, it's engagement most likely through our, our VC, our CVC um, in, the, in the Valley. So if, um, if there's something particular, and again, our, our CVC isn't just about airlines or aviation. It's more broadly sort of the travel ribbon and how technology plays into that. Um, so that's certainly a source for us. And I think you're seeing a lot more larger corporations take this approach. Uh, because you want to sort of be at the fore of these developments. So I suspect that we're not alone or unique in that instance. So that's kind of the first place I would, I would look or I would start um, in terms of a particular company or industry that you want to engage in. Industry associations are another uh, interesting entry point. Um, certainly we have those as well. But Yeah, I think every obviously every company is going to be different. Every sector is going to be different. Some are going to be providing capital to these types of organizations. Some of them are going to be providing partnership opportunities, some technology. And so I think it depends on, on where it is. For us, we're doing a lot of our engagement on the tech side. So if there is um, you know, something that you think machine learning or, or data tagging and would, would help in, in the work that you're doing, you know, we'd love to, to hear about it. Um, and then sometimes there could be other opportunities within Microsoft once it comes in that way. So we have one minute left, and I'm going to uh, wrap with one question. I just want to go down the line. There, are, there is a, a conversation out there about uh, climate change and about uh, technology and about um, opportunities to stem the tide here that are weighted towards risk management, and there are others that are weighted towards a huge innovation opportunity and a economic growth opportunity, although in the short term, short term, there may be a slowing because of it. Start, Brandon, with you. 
when you think about risk management on one side versus an economic growth opportunity, how do you think about that? Um, so the cop-out answer is to say both, right? Yeah. So presumably that's not allowed. I was waiting for you to say that. And then the it's second okay. thing I would say as a lawyer, I would say risk management. But, but really, truly, I believe as a senior leader at this company and being the secretary to the board and having a view, uh, we really have to look for those game-changing sort of step change technology or innovations because otherwise the, the incremental approach um, will find, we'll just always be sort of catching up. I think in the world that I live in, there's a recognition that there's lots of risk management happening out there and that there's, there, that, that exists across the landscape. There's not enough focus on innovation and next generation uh, uh, solutions. And so, you know, I happen to work for a guy who is always thinking 30 or 40 or 50 years out. So we are 100% focused on the innovation mm -hmm. side of that. I hate being on the side of the bench that's really heavily weighted. <laughs> uh, our company's mission is to empower every individual and organization to achieve more. So we definitely, you know, would, would look at the side of opportunity. And just going back to the employee question, um, it's not just about that they want to take action on these issues. Some of these challenges from a computational perspective are some of the most mm -hmm. intriguing and complicated mm -hmm. areas, and that's where they want to work because they're, they're the most exciting yeah. and, and difficult to crack. So I think we're in the, the opportunity and the innovation um, side of this. I think that's a great way to, to, uh, to, to wrap. I think I, I personally find that there is uh, uh, a, a large number of folks who are focused on risk management and mitigation and less with the exception of all three of you, and many of this audience focused on the offensive play here and how innovation can drive solutions that will take us to a much better place going forward. Thank you all for being with us today. Big hand for our uh, panelists.